good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sazizo, and I'm a curator here at New Art Exchange, and you're tuned in to New Art Exchange Online. And so um, thank you so much for joining us um, for this um, edition of Reading Beyond. Reading Beyond is an informal reading group and forum as part of an ongoing Beyond Black History Month program in collaboration with All Black Connects between the Lines Book Club. All Black Connect are a collective of young black people aged 18 to 30 based at New Art Exchange. So with the Reading Beyond um, Book Club, um, it's an opportunity to collectively discuss texts by black authors that speak to socio-political urgencies, historical and ecological themes related to black life. The chosen writings flow between local, national and global contexts to catalyze new perspectives and expand on existing knowledge within the group. This season's chosen book, Pitch Black, is by author Emmy Onuora and it critically scrutinizes the attitudes of FIFA, the FA, and the media over the last half century, and asks what is to be done to combat the subtler forms of racism that undeniably persist even today. Featuring startling revelations from all levels of the footballing fraternity, Pitch Black takes a frank and controversial look at the history of the world's most popular sport and culture. And before we get into the event and introduce our two speakers today, just wanted to let you know that um, while delivering uh, content online, NAE strives to create a safe and secure environment where guests, staff and audiences can work together confidently and in mutual respect. This event is being recorded and will remain online for future reference. To ask questions during the Q&A, you can use the chat function on YouTube. If there are a lot of questions that we're not able to get through um, during the course of the event, we'll curate them specifically for the panel. And of course, do feel free to talk to each other and engage in conversation using the chat feature. And finally, the work that we do means a lot to us. And we'd love for you to hear back, and we'd love to hear feedback from you. So we'll post a link online to our survey in the chat. And if you could please take a few minutes to complete this short survey, after today's event, it would really help us continue to improve the work that we do. So on to our guest speakers for today. So first of all, author of Pitch Black, Emmy Onuora. Emmy has an MA in Ethnic Studies and Race Relations from the University of Liverpool and has lectured extensively on issues of race and sport within higher education. He was co-editor of Merseyside-based football fanzine, What's the Score?, and is the brother of former footballer, coach and Ethiopian national team manager, Ifi Onuora. Emmy lives in Liverpool. And our second guest today, um, who Emmy will be in conversation with, is James Denham, a member of All Black Connect, which I'd mentioned is um, NAE's collective of young black creatives. He is also the founder of Black Friends, a Nottingham-based creative platform aiming to facilitate the frank conversations about race and identity. So we'll get on to our speakers um, and do enjoy the conversation and do engage in it as well. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. So, Emmy, it's nice to finally meet you. Um, I hope nice to be here. I hope the journey from Liverpool wasn't too strenuous <coughs> for you. Not at all. Yeah. Obviously, you're here in Nottingham. It's not the first time you've been here. I know before you explained to me that you, you visited a few occasions, obviously, watch football matches at Notts Forest. But Nottingham is obviously an amazing place for the history of football. Um, in fact, especially black footballers in particular. You know, we've got Jermaine Genus, Viv Anderson, Wes Morgan, Jermaine Pennant, and mm -hmm. many more that you mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. Why is it? that so many black players have been able to get through the glass ceiling that's often put in front of black mm -hmm. players. What is it particularly about Nottingham that's enabled them to break through? It was, it's a good question because yeah. when I was doing the research for the book, it wasn't necessarily something I was expecting mm. to find. But uh, it became apparent as, as, uh, as I was interviewing footballers and conducting the research for the book that Nottingham emerged as one of the kind of uh, focal points of black football and so many people who you've mentioned have emerged from the city in the area to become professional footballers and I did ask a couple of footballers why it was the case and I think the answers are that uh, I think the answers are that uh, it was a footballing infrastructure, mm. for want of a better word. So uh, a collection a, a collection of uh, coaches and teams 
black coaches, black black teams who who uh, who encouraged black boys mm. to, to to play football, and uh, in fact, I think it was uh, Michael Johnson, ex uh, Derby player who was born in Nottingham said that it was almost a kind of rites of passage, that mm. this was something that black boys did. At some point, they played organised football. So I think with that uh, infrastructure and that solid foundation, mm. um, you know, you saw, you've seen, you know, generations of uh, black footballers come, go into the game and go out and do some amazing things, mm. and others not quite so amazing, but important in their own right. And uh, and I think that's the reason why Nottingham's such a kind of hotbed of mm. black football. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, when we're speaking about black footballers, the first one that comes to mind, of course, is Viv Anderson, because he was the first black player to make you know his debut for England. Uh -huh. I, I know I read in the book that you spoke about the fact that he actually got a telegram from the Queen and Elton John, and Elton John. in the in the run up to the game. So. You know, could you just give me an idea about the social impact that, that, that Viv Anderson's debut had for the Black British community? Uh, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was massive, actually. Uh, I, think, I think in the, in the years and months leading up to him making his debut, there was definitely lots of talk about which black footballer was going to be the first. It was a matter of, it was a case of not, not if, but when. Mm. And uh, it, it became apparent that, uh, that sooner or later a black footballer was going to make their full England debut and it was just a question of who it was. And uh, Laurie Cunningham was probably the favourite. Mm. Uh, he'd, he'd, he was quite an established under-21 footballer. Cyril Regis also played under-21s for the Indian team. And, and surprisingly, Viv Anderson didn't play for the under-21s at all. But of course he played in that you know, amazing Forest side uh, that won the league, two, two European Cups, a host of other trophies. And, you know, being, being, uh, being part of that team that had done so well, obviously was going to bring him to prominence. Mm. And so I do remember at the time, there was lots of, um, there was lots of talk. When, he, when, his, when his name was announced that he was going to play, I, I remember, I think, personally, I think, he was in the squad, but we weren't necessarily sure he was gonna mm. he was gonna play. He might come on a sub and everything else. And I think in the in the days running up to it, it became apparent that he was gonna play. And because I live in Liverpool and not in the East Midlands, uh, I didn't see it. But BBC East Midlands actually went to his parents' home and interviewed him about the significance of this. So, uh, so the significance of it was quite well documented at the time and so it was massive in I mean it was in 1978 it was very rare to mm. see black people on television and uh, you know there were no there wasn't really the you know there, there might have been one or two tv presenters mm. literally one or two yeah. but it was very rare to see anyone black on television let alone being featured mm. and so uh, I imagine that you know, in the East Midlands, uh, it would have been a big deal for the BBC camera crew mm. to go round to his parents' house and talk about the significance of it. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, definitely a a a, 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 big, a massive big achievement, and in a sense that opened that uh, that was that opened the door for other players mm. to uh, to come through. I think Laurie Cun um, Laurie Cunningham eventually made his mm. debut a few months later. And uh, and then several others, you know, uh, right up to the present day. And now we have something like a, probably a majority of the the last England team yeah. where where you know uh, black footballers, and most of them, I think nearly all of them, probably with the exception of one or two, mm. can with distinctly, you know, with a, with a, with the sons of immigrants. Mm. So I think it's. Uh, you know, he, he was definitely a trailblazer in, yeah. in that sense. And I think it was just a question of who was going to be first. Mm. And fortunately, it was him. Mm. I mean, like you mentioned when you answered that question, a lot of the black players that were tipped to make their debut were often attacking players like Laurie Cunningham, obviously, and Cyril Regis. So I'm, I'm sort of interested to know if you feel that 
you know, Viv Anderson making his debut, being a defensive player, did that sort of signify a kind of turning point? Because often, you know, there was a lot of this sort of assumption that black footballers probably couldn't be trusted to play those kind of more mentally aware areas in the pitch, maybe in central midfield or uh-huh. as a centre-back. So did that sort of mark a key pivotal moment for, for black footballers there, that the first black British player to play for England played in central defence and kind of changed that narrative a little bit more? I think... I think, I think it- I think the expectation was. Mm. I think most most footballers at that t- most black footballers mm. at that time were certainly attackers, mm. either wingers or strikers. There was the odd, there was the odd defender, uh, a, a few fullbacks. Um, I'm thinking at the time, apart from Viv Anderson, there was probably there was one or two others. Uh, certainly Brendan Batten springs to mind. He played for it was it was one yeah. of the three degrees, um, and a couple of others. But so I think the expectation, the expectation certainly was, and the and the stereotypes attributed to black footballers was certainly was they, they were strikers, they were wingers, mm. they were then they played in those positions because they were naturally you know great athletes, but uh, and you could put them on the on the wing because they were fast and skillful, and uh, but not in the middle way you know it, it called for some kind of you know thought and, uh, and, and and having the right mentality. Mm. So I think the fact that he was a defender probably challenged a few stereotypes at the time, uh, most certainly, but I don't think it was, uh, but I don't think, but, but the kind of sea change, if you like, of, uh, of, of more black players playing in central mm. midfield, didn't really occur until probably in the 90s right. with Paul Ince probably. Mm. Uh, there had been others, but probably Paul Ince was the kind of main one mm. where the stereotypes began to kind of fall away. Mm, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you've spoken about this, you know, what we just spoke about there, having that attitude that black players you know, lacked the mental fortitude to uh-huh. play in those positions. I just kind of wanted to get your ideas on where that kind of assumption came from and, and where that's <laughs> rooted in. It's really interesting because I think the assumptions go back to probably the turn of the century, yeah. uh, the late, the late, eight, the late nineteen hundreds, mm. probably when, <coughs> when ideas, pseudo scientific ideas about the capabilities of black people in general, mm. uh, all started to emerge. So you got. Um, you got the the development of pseudo sciences like craniology and phrenology, mm. which uh, which asserted that you know, it was just it wouldn't stand up to any scientific rigor today. But but as scientific thought was developing, these kind of newfangled scientific ideas. Uh, were taken hold as a new and, and, and were used to justify. Uh, well, they were used for two things: to justify colonialism and racism, but also to justify sport and exclusion. So, if you, th- so at the turn of the uh, at the late 1900s and the early part of the 20th century, <clears throat> if you take the example of boxing. Mm. Uh, Whites weren't allowed to fight for the heavyweight title. In fact, it wasn't until after the Second World War that black people were allowed to fight for a British title. Right. Um, but, but famously, Jack Johnson was the most dominant heavyweight in the 1900s. Mm. Nobody wanted to fight him uh, because they didn't want to be the one who would lose their title to a black man. And there were all kinds of rumours abound about why he was... Why, why, you know, about the capabilities of black sports people and boxers in particular. So there was things like, there were things mentioned that uh, that they were too, that if you punched them, if, if they were susceptible to a particularly good body blow. Mm. They didn't have the stamina, for example, uh, of white fighters, uh, and they certainly didn't have the heart of white fighters uh, and everything else. And Jack Johnson kind of smashed all of those stereotypes by being. Uh, more skillful, punching harder, more scientifically, you know, um, uh, def- a, a very defensively astute boxer as well. Mm. Uh, and so 
in in terms of a sporting in, in terms of a sporting stereotypes, that's kind of where it starts to be official. I mean, probably all of these stereotypes emerged as kind of folklore, uh, verbal folklore, but they began to be written down about what black players and black people were kind of capable of. And so there was a common idea that, uh, and so all of these ideas uh, emerged, you know, e even, even in the 1930s with uh, Jesse Owens smashing stereotypes yeah. about Aryan supremacy at the 30s or 6th Berlin Olympics, uh, right up into the 60s where Kenyans and Eastern Europe, uh, East, uh, East Africans began to dominate some of the longer distance events, challenged the idea that black people were only good for strong, quick, explosive events, mm. and, uh, and everything else. So all, and and they still, they still, those stereotypes are still around today. Mm. You think about what people say about someone like Simone Biles, yeah. and, uh, and even, in, even within the NBA, you know, black, athlete, black basketballers are always great athletes, uh, white, uh, for some reason, white basketball players are never described as great athletes, mm. even though they are. Um, but the more, but the, but, you know, the, the, they talk about having, you know, smarts and courage and a whole range of other kind of qualities. Mm. Um, so, you know, sports is one of the few areas where such poor science yeah. still exists mm. and where you can still get away with talking about, uh, you know, the, the inherent traits, if you like, of, uh, of black sports stars. And so uh, that's where essentially those ideas emerged from and, uh, and have slowly been challenged and shattered, not by, by just the performance of you know, a succession of black sports stars and in this case, footballers. Mm, definitely. I mean, on the subject, obviously, of Nottingham Forest there and, and Viv Anderson, the key figure that we have to mention, uh -huh. of course, is Brian Clough, uh -huh. you know. It's interesting because reading the book, it kind of made me, I guess, question the legacy that Clough has sort of left behind. I mean, you, you, you've included a couple of anecdotes mm -hmm. where, you know, he's trying to sort of pump up Viv Anderson and get him to shake off a lot of the racist abuse that he would take, you know, when he's warming up on the sides of, of the pitch and so on. And I know, I think you noted that he was potentially one of the original signatories of this 1977 anti-Nazi league. Yeah, absolutely. But then there are some sort of more contradictory elements within the book as well. And, and there's a big section where you're talking about the tour that a lot of uh, England players played, which I think was set up by Jimmy Hill. That's right, yeah. To play against uh, teams in South Africa, which yeah. obviously at the time was, there was a boycott on competition with South African sports teams. And mm -hmm. Clough, you described, sort of did play a role in you know, getting Calvin Plummer, a young forest player at the time, to, to go along to the tour. And he was kind of held out, hung out to dry, really, when he came back from that. And also, you know, there's the issue of Justin Fashionu. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's quite widely reported that Cuff was, you know, overtly homophobic to yeah. him. So I just kind of you know, wanted to pose the question, and maybe you could discuss a bit more th that Springbok tour as well. Uh -huh. You know, was, you know, Clough sincere in his, you know, support of black British players? Or, or was he, you know, being a manager, was he using them as a means to an end? It's a, it's, it's a really yeah. good question, and I suppose... Really, I suppose only his close family will yeah. know, yeah. know the I'll know the definitive answers. Mm. But to speculate, uh, I think he came from I think Clough came from a working a working class tradition and was conscious of the fact that he came from a working class family, and so we therefore had labour leaning sentiments, mm. and and so on, and 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 I think. I, you know, I distinctly remember in the 70s and the 80s, he'd, he'd always be one of those kind of, uh, for want of a better word, celebrity Labour voters. Yeah. He, always, he was always very clear about his political allegiances. Mm. But then, and, and I think signing, the, being a signatory to the Anti-Nazi League was part of that view, world view of himself that he, that he saw. But then he contradicts it by breaking the breaking the uh, war by helping mm. to break the uh, the boycott uh, the, the, 
you know, that was that was clearly in place at the time, the sport and cultural boycott that was in place against the apartheid regime, and he helped to kind of break that. Um, what had happened for people who aren't aware is that in uh, probably in about 8081, a few aging footballers uh, went on a went on a tour to South Africa, sponsored by South African breweries. Uh, organised by uh, former former head of the PFA and television presenter and former football manager Jimmy Hill. He was the one who organised the, the boycott, but he was aided and abetted by, by Brian Clough, and the way in which Brian Clough aided and abetted him was to send his own trainer along. Um, but he also knew that it was important to get, to justify it, or to, be, to bring some kind of justification to it. All of these kind of Asian footballers were white, white and towards the end of their careers. Uh, they needed a black footballer to, to give it some kind of justification. Mm. And, uh, and Calvin Plummer was the one who was, was, uh, was, was approached by Brian Clough and asked to go on this tour. And, uh, and that's what he did. And, you know, I think he was, you know, was, I think they were all quite handsomely paid. Mm. But Calvin Plum was the only, was the only um, black footballer there. He was the only, uh, he was the youngest by far of the footballers. He says when he got there to South Africa, he was, he was, he was treated as an honorary white. He was allowed, um, he was allowed to frequent the same beaches, hotels, uh, public spaces as his, you know, kind of white counter, as his white teammates, and he played a series of games which were, which were, uh, you know, which were kind of mired in controversy um, and boycotts and demonstrations and so on, and was eventually kind of cut short. But Calvin Plummer came home from that, and he said he was. He said he didn't really know much about apartheid at the time. He was uh, he was uh, he was quite naive, um, kind of encouraged by his dad to kind of go away and earn a, earn, earn a few bob as well, earn some money, and uh, and obviously by his manager, and uh, and was kind of a little bit hung out to dry really because when they all came back, um, there was you know they were they were met with uh, a sea of kind of uh, press. At Heathrow Airport, I think it was, and uh, you know there was no official spokesperson to give an official, definitive kind of press statement. Yeah. They were all kind of scattered and left to kind of fend for themselves. And as a kind of 19-year-old, that, that was what happened to Calvin Plummer. Uh, so I think, in the grand scheme of things, he emerged from it relatively unscathed. I think, uh, but 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 certainly left a bitter taste amongst other footballers mm. of his generation uh, who, who were appalled, to be honest, at his behaviour mm. uh, or, as it, as it, or, or his endorsement um, of, the, uh, of the kind of sanctions busting tour of South Africa. Yeah, definitely. I wanted to sort of move on then and, and talk a bit more about chapter eight of the book, mm -hmm. which is um, quite interesting because it starts initially talking about um, the sort of hair culture that was prevalent <laughs> amongst sort of black British players. Obviously, being footballers, they weren't sort of constrained by, you know, the workplace or school or uh -huh. colleges, for example. So they could kind of use that as a centre stage to kind of showcase black culture and, and, and hair as well. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on why it was so important to talk about that and, and raise that in the book the way that you did. I think, I think for me, it was... There was I think I think for me it was it was kind of part of the reason why I did the, part of the reason why I did the book was that I wanted to I wanted to place what happened what happens to mm. and the experience of black footballs within the kind of context of growing up or being black British mm. individual or uh, it's all placed within the context of being of the experiences or the generalized experiences of black people in the at the times and barbershops still play quite an important part in 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 black communities 
and I think, and that's something that's always been a feature of mm. black communities, the barbershop where, where I, I remember me dad, me, me dad taking me and my brothers to the barbershop and we just found it this place where older fellas would be talking about the, a variety of things, sport, politics, culture, what was got, what other things going on in the, in the community. So here's an important part of black identity. Mm. Uh, we know this because, you know, kids still get excluded from schools yeah. because of it. And so here was a kind of important part of black identity and I wanted to just kind of demonstrate the, re, the you know, that it was also an important part of uh, the identity of black footballers. And as you said, it was, one of, it was one of the ways in which you can showcase or, or celebrate your blackness mm. without, you know, uh, without um, raising a gloved fist or, or, or having a banner or wearing red, gold and green. It was, mm. just, it was just an opportunity to kind of uh, celebrate your blackness in a... In a in a way that wasn't overt, mm. but but was nonetheless really important because, mm. uh, and the other thing as well is, it was where other young people got their ideas for having their haircuts as well. Um, so those pe those footballers acted as kind of role models. And uh, I mean, I remember even, you know, I've got nowhere now, but even, <laughs> even, even in the 80s, when Carl Lewis first had a kind of flat top. Yeah. I remember going to me barb and saying, give us a Carl Lewis. <laughs> so it was one of those, it, it's one of those um, things which, uh, which, you know, you kind of emulate your own models yeah. and, uh, and having your hair cut in the style of them is one mm. of the ways in which you, you kind of do that. Yeah, I mean, speaking of like footballers and haircuts, a bit of a cheeky question, but I would love to know what your favourite footballer's haircut is. I personally am a Go big on. fan of the sort of Ronaldo 2002 little clip there that okay. he had. What's, your, what's the best black British footballer's haircut you could pull out? <laughs> there's, 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 a, there's a few. Tony Daly. Right. Tony Daly uh, at Aston Villa. Mm. And obviously this neck of the woods uh, and everything else. But Tony Daly's haircut was probably... My favourite, which I think I, I just used to go, oh, would I, I think I think publicly, I think it was, um, you know, it was a, it was kind of a guilty pleasure. Mm. Uh, it was wrong for so many reasons, but it, it was it was. I think I had secret admiration mm. for the way which he pulled it off. So Tony Daly's haircuts were good, but I'd, but I, I, I must admit George Berry, who. In the in the seventies, sported a big afro mm. at a time when that was far more political than maybe having dreadlocks yeah. would be today. I think I think uh, he pr that's, that that would probably be my favourite just because of the time in mm. which he played and what it signified as well. I mean, it's true. Remy Moses as well, who also played for West Brom, had also sported a massive and went on to play for Man United. But also sported a massive great afro as well. But uh, but I think they they probably they probably my favourites. I think a little special shout out though goes to Jamie Lawrence who played for Leicester yeah. uh, because he just didn't care and he just <laughs> would have his hair in so many different colours and mm. everything else. So probably we, my uh, favourites. Can we also not forget about Rude Hullet? I know that we're not. <laughs> I know that we're talking about black British footballers, but no, even yeah. just thinking, sorry to put in, no, yeah, I we're talking about it. here, but um, even just thinking about like, um, you know, you were just speaking about like a political statement mm. without being overtly political and celebrating blackness. And I was just thinking about some of the footballers who had dreads, even just Definitely. like Rude Hullet, Edgar Davids, mm. um, you know. Rude Hullet was probably the first to have, mm. I think, he, I think it was probably the first, the first I can remember, I think, to have dreadlocks um, and to have them kind of proudly. And it was, and he also did a, a really poor record as well, reggae record as well, recorded right. uh, a really poor record. I'll have to which, check which that out afterwards. <laughs> it's on, it'll, be, it'll be on yeah. YouTube somewhere. So, uh, you know, which, which bothered the Dutch charts, I think. Mm. 
as well. So yeah, so Rude Hull its hairstyle was probably revolutionary in its in its own kind of sense, in, within its own context. Yeah, he was probably the first one to have dreadlocks um, and sport them proudly. Yeah, and then he went on to be captain of his club and his country. Yeah. Is you know, there's a, there's a dreadlock man ca mm. captain of his club and country. So in Europe as well. Yeah. In, in yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, so definitely important. <laughs> And obviously, for the large part of that chapter as well, you talk about you know, Liverpool and Everton and, uh -huh. and, of course, John Barnes's career. But I just wanted to focus a little bit, first of all, on, on Liverpool as a city. And uh -huh. we spoke about, obviously, a bit earlier on about Nottingham and how many you know, great black British footballers that have been produced there. I just kind of wanted to speak about why it's... It, it, for me, it, it seems as... You might be able to correct me, but mm. it seems as though it, it, it took a long time for the, the, the two big clubs in Liverpool to accept black British footballers. And for, for, for a city that, you know, is a port city and mm -hmm. has a sizable black community, mm -hmm. I just wondered, you know, that, like you've said, in Nottingham, there was clearly some kind of infrastructure, you know, whether it was set up, you know, informally, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. you know, but I wondered why that was happening in Liverpool and why it took so long for, for, for the Liverpool clubs to accept black British players. I know once John Barnes signed for Liverpool, you, you mentioned in the book and you wrote about this, that you know, the Everton fans prided themselves yeah, yeah. on the fact that their team was you know, a white team, yeah. even though they were doing quite mediocre yeah. at that period. Yeah. So I wondered if you had, you know, being from Liverpool and yourself, if you could potentially fill us in on why that hangover was. Yeah, it's... it's, it's I mean, sure, it's quite hard to pin down. Really, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to pin down the, the precise reason. Mm. There is, there has been traditionally a sport, you know, there, there is a succession of uh, black football teams who play, black footballers and mm. black football teams who played in and around the city. So there was a tradition, mm. if you like, of, of, of black, of men from, and boys from the black community playing organised football, mm. being in leagues, and uh, and being good footballers as well so there is there's definitely that tradition what there wasn't was but the clubs just did not their scouting their scouting systems such as they were just excluded mm. uh, black footballers um from the local area cliff marshall was the first local uh, black footballer to be signed by any of the two clubs uh, and he was signed for Everton in 75, 76, something mm. like that. I mean, uh, it, it probably helped that he was an England schoolboy international right. and that probably helped him mm. that if he wasn't picked up by Everton, who was his boyhood, boyhood club, he would have been picked up by somebody. Right. And so I think being an England schoolboy international definitely helped him uh, at the time. But other than him, and then a bit later, Howard Gale uh, signed for Liverpool th four to five years later, maybe. And then there was a big gap. Mm. Uh, I can't believe, I'm just trying to think. Uh, there's, a, there's a big gap until the 2000s, really. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just something that their scout mechanisms didn't bother with. I don't know why that is. Uh, well, I can speculate. I think it was just proper, just just old lazy stereotypes really mm. about black people, black footballers, and so on and so forth. And uh, and I think they're probably the the causes. I mean, Liverpool's got the oldest black community in Europe. Mm. Um, it's been you know it's uh, Liverpool's famed for being an Irish city. Yeah. Somewhere in the region, a seventy-five percent of the city can trace its heritage back to to Ireland. Uh, the black community's been 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 in Liverpool as long as the Irish, and it predates and actually predates the big wave of uh, Irish immigration that came around the time of the you know seventeenth and 18, you know it's around the time of the kind of potato famine. Mm. Uh, it kind of, there's always been an Irish presence in the city, so it probably goes hand in hand with the, his, historically with, in terms of the length of time, but it's an old 
black community, a long established one, but yet they've never, the, uh, the football clubs have never seen, or have very rarely seen fit to kind of mine, um, you know, talent from, from its black communities uh, to play in its teams. And that didn't change really on a kind of systematic basis and probably until the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Well, moving on to John Barnes a little bit more then. Obviously, his journey into football is, is quite unique because obviously he grew up in Jamaica and out of a lot of those sort of Caribbean countries, Jamaica is a place where football is the dominant sport as opposed yeah, to cricket. Uh -huh. But one thing I just wanted to highlight in particular with John Barnes is obviously he played for England and he was a, a mercurial talent. You know, you know, he was widely regarded as one of the best black mm -hmm. British footballers, if not one of the best, surely one of Liverpool's best players, mm. really, to put on their shirt. But I know a lot of, t obviously it's before my time, mm. but I know in the press, sometimes when things weren't going well for the England side or, or maybe for John Barnes when he was playing, there was sometimes speculation be because of his, you know, his heritage and his lineage in Jamaica that perhaps he didn't have the same courage or he w didn't have the loyalty to the team that the rest of the squad did. Mm. And obviously just sort of drawing on what happened earlier on this summer mm -hmm. with England's defeat in the Euro 2020 final and a lot of the players in that squad mm. having you know, heritages from all over the Commonwealth and mm. different areas of the world. I just wondered, and I guess a more sort of broad question, why is it that when black people fail, particularly obviously in sports as well, why are we always othered? Why, why is it when we don't play the good immigrant we're made to feel like we're not British. Because I always think about Linford Christie, for example, when he, when he won the gold medal, it was, oh, this great British sprinter. Of course. But when he had that false start a few years later, all of a sudden he's, he's othered, he's, he's not British anymore. He's, he's something else and, and different and separate from, from mm. British identity. So I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about John Barnes and how his Jamaican heritage was often used against him at times. Of course. Yeah. Well, our acceptance, as, our acceptance as British subject is always conditional. Mm. Uh, it's conditional on the fact that we, you know, unless you're the kind of Frank Bruno in his heyday yeah. type, yeah. Um, you're not seen as being black. It's always conditional. It's always conditional to a standard that is impossible to maintain, mm. uh, to be honest. You can't always be... Things are going to go wrong uh, as a, you know, the nature of sport means that you've only got a limited shelf life. So at some point, you know, uh, you, you, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, a, you, you're going to lose a big game or a big fight or a big contest or a big competition. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's always, it's always conditional on, on, which says, well, you are you are British, but only on our terms, mm. and so therefore, um, the the notion of being black and British, particularly at that time, was still incompatible. Mm. With, with the two things were still incompatible. At the time, uh, Norman Tebbit, who was a Tory minister at the time, uh, had had you know uh, speculated as to whether or not the sh you know. Uh, where all immigrants' allegiances were, and he used sport in particular, cricket specifically, uh, as, as a kind of litmus test of mm. people's allegiances. So, uh, you know, looking at Asian communities, did they, did they support India at cricket or Pakistan at cricket or Bangladesh at cricket? Or did the West Indian community support the West Indies at cricket? And that was his kind of litmus test and where they supported you know, the, the country of the, their, their birth or their parents' birth, instead of, instead of uh, celebrating it or understanding it or recognising it as, 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 as something that's part respect, part a kind of natural allegiance mm. of things, he chose to denigrate uh, black British people for it, and to and to and to say that the and to use it as an example as to uh, to justify why, in his opinion, black people aren't really British, yeah. and that the and the, and being black and British is incompatible. Mm. So that was the context within which John Barnes was playing. 
uh, for England at the time. And actually, the reasons he didn't play particularly well, or his or his or his experience playing for England was quite. Uh, he had sporadic good yeah. games, and then it was inconsistent. He had some inconsistencies because when he was at Liverpool, he was in, he, he was a, he, he was allowed to do what he, not allowed to do what he wanted, yeah. but he was given the freedom to read the game as he saw fit and to play in areas where he could do most damage. Mm. Uh, when he was playing for England, he was told to do all the things that he wasn't particularly good at. Well, mm. he could do, he could yeah. do reasonably well. But staying on the touchline, tracking back, why would you have John Barnes tracking <laughs> back? Yeah. Uh, but a succession mm. of England managers did, did this. And so they didn't really get the best out of him. England at the time were in a period where it had been 20, 25 years since they'd won the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, their status uh, within the top tier of international teams had, was dimin- had diminished and was diminishing. And people were looking for scapegoats. And, you know, John Barnes was the, was the scapegoat. It, it, it mirrors a lot of what happened to Raheem Sterling, kind right. of... Uh, 20 odd years, 25 years later, right. a little bit. He was probably the Raheem Sterling mm. of his day, mm. actually. Um, I mean, even Raheem Sterling, because he's been, he was born in Jamaica yeah. and so on, has, has, has had that as well. Yeah. Uh, that question and his, uh, question and his allegiance to England. Um, but. They, 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 there's an answer in there somewhere about <laughs> about why it was yeah. that he was vilified quite so much. Mm. But uh, it, it's it's a compliant press looking for mm. looking for answers, and you know the the, the press particularly at the time. And I mean, I want to say at the time, you know, uh, it's only it's only in recent years that uh, that, 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 that the press's depiction of black footballers has been challenged by yeah. Raheem Sterling. Yeah. Uh, that's only relatively new, and mm. if you can imagine. That during the, uh, the 80s and the 70s and the 80s in particular, particularly within the context of uh, black people demonstrating inner city riots, uh, stop and search, uh, features about, uh, I mean, if you're thinking about othering, you know, black communities were spectacularly othered mm. during that uh, kind of whole period. So there were, there were icons like Linford Christie when he was doing well. Frank Bruno, when he was doing well, who were kind of lauded as good immigrants and mm. people who other black people should look up to. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as they didn't do well, then they were kind of lambasted. Mm. So those people are kind of set up as, a, you know, to be good immigrants. Mm. That's, that's, that's what it is. And it enables, and the kind of good Im- Im- immigrant trope allows people to pretend they're not racist mm. uh, by lauding black people who are good immigrants while lambasting the vast majority mm. of people who don't fit into that kind of their uh, box. Yeah, definitely. We have maybe one more question before we can get some questions from the YouTube stream. Mm. Just to finish off about chapter eight in particular, one story that really, we spoke about this off camera actually uh-huh. before we, we started the interview okay. is, is John Barnes is obviously most well well remembered in an England shirt at uh-huh. least for that that goal against Brazil in the Maracanã. Uh-huh. And I remember you spoke about this in the book, uh-huh. and you talked about the fact that you know when he was uh, when they were on tour, you know the England team going in around South America, they were joined by a set of you know members of the National Front uh-huh. travelling with the players uh-huh. and officials and so on and. You know, John Barnes, I think Mark Chamberlain, you wrote, were, yeah. were, you know, subject to racial abuse at the hands of these National Front members. And I was saying to you earlier, you know, as someone that's, you know, born in the last 26 years, it's, it's difficult for me to kind of comprehend the kind of influence that the National Front had <laughs> throughout the latter half of the 20th century, mm. particularly in football. So I just wanted some insight into 
you know, how the National Front came to have such a, um, an affiliation with football and, and how they're even able, it seems ludicrous now, doesn't it? How they're even able to be on um, you know, the official travel plane with the rest of the players and so on. Of course, there's, there's always been, uh, sort of, you know, British, British politics, like a lot of European politics mm. actually, has always had a, you know, uh, an odd streak of fascist allegiances within its kind of polit you know body politic so there's always and 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 you know uh, certain periods it, the far right immediately after the second world war were kind of in the doldrums you know we just fought nazis and uh, they were in the doldrums they were um, you know people had fought the second world war uh, you know, to defeat fascism, etc., etc. Um, what what post-war black immigration from the the Caribbean, from the Indian subcontinent, most most particularly, uh, did was re reinvigorate mm. the far right. Uh, so you had all these disparate far-right groups who came together, hence the National Front, they all came together as a, as a national body, these disparate far-right groups who had spent lots of time arguing with each other and fighting, physically fighting with each other over, you know, minor ideological differences. Uh, all kind of decided to settle the differences because this opportunity around immigration was too... was too good an opportunity to mobilise around and, and, uh, and try and grow. So what you had, and it's quite interesting, at the same time as Nottingham had uh, riots and race riots in 1958, Notting Hill had race riots sparked in large me by, by a large extent to the activities of far-right organisations. So by the t and, and that carried on, and, and, and also the big, the big catalyst for the far right, who were kind of bubbling under the saves, was Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech in '68. Yeah. That was when the far right really kind of, uh, because they were now their ideas were now in the political mainstream, mm. uh, not marginalised it, but the, their ideas were in the political mainstream. And that gave a lot of impetus. Now, his, his Rivers of Blood speech was 68. Mm. One of the places where the far right thought they could organise, on, and, did, and in fact did organise, was, uh, was, around, was around two areas, was, was, was particularly around immigration. Mm. Uh, uh, and so, for many communities, for many black communities up and down the country, living under the threat of the far right and the, th you know, where, where repatriation was, I mean, it seems inconceivable, it, it, incon it was probably inconceivable at the time, yeah. but, it's, but it seems inconceivable now that there were political parties whose, whose policies were about repatriation, people of colour back to the, whatever it was they, they came from, and that that was a serious political philosophy. Mm. Uh, how how that would that work in practice in this day and age? I'm not really, or even then, to be honest, would would it's it's difficult to kind of fathom out. But it, it but it but it brought but it it fed into uh, a strain of kind of you know uh, British thoughts that the country was was being taken over by immigrants, that it was changing their way of life. Um, uh, and all of those, and so they started to get electoral success, particularly in big cities and particularly in areas where blacks and whites kind of lived cheek by jowl. So even in places like West Bromwich, you we were talking about off air before, you know, they were getting significant electoral success, particularly in by elections, particularly in council elections. In some places, even, even you know, it seems inconceivable now, but even in parts of London, the National Front were making significant political inroads. That didn't finish until 
the Tory party in 79, when, when Thatcher was elected, stole a lot of their kind of clothes yeah. and introduced the British Nationality Act mm. in 81. And in a sense, you know, some of the far right found a home inside the Tory party, uh, but they came to power on a kind of anti-immigration uh, as part, you know, amongst other things, but certainly anti-immigration was part of that narrative that they came to power on. They were going to sort immigration out and everything else. So, in a nutshell, I've, you know, I've, I've probably done you know, post-war, second world, post-second world war history there in about three or four minutes. But, <laughs> but they're the kind of reasons yeah. why the far right, if you like, had such uh, were, were quite prominent at the yeah. time. And it wasn't till really the the you know organisations like anti anti Nazi League, right. uh, which Brian Clough was mm. a signatory to, and things like Rock Against Racism, mm. and uh, you know it wasn't until they got a kind of foothold, and particularly amongst young people, that uh, that they were challenged, and they were challenged um, uh, physically in some cases because you know the the you know if you read if you read um, stories about the way in which they used to terrorise communities, particularly say in the east end of London on Brick Lane and so on and so forth, the far right used to uh, just terrorise communities um, and so on. They had to be kind of confronted physically, they had to be told you don't, you will not you will, you will not terrorise this community and if you don't and if, and, and if you try to, we won't let you. And the only way we can do that is physically. So that had to be done as part of um, as part of the uh, campaign against uh, against the rise of the far right and uh, and fascism. So that was really important developments. And they did, particularly the anti anti Nazi League and Rock Against Racism, did have a, a significant effect, particularly amongst um, working class white kids. Yeah. Uh, particularly those who were kind of into music and so on, yeah, mm. quite important. Yeah, brilliant. Are we okay to take a break and um, do yeah, some? So yeah? We, yeah, we've got some questions. Um, so I have a um, question, um, but I'll go on to the questions from um, our, um, to some of the people who are watching on YouTube. So the first question that we have is from Jade. Um, and it's, do you think the issues of racism in football translates to the women's game? Wow. Um, yeah, I think it does by and large. Uh, what's what? The, the, there are some differences within the women's game. I think what's what's uh, first of all for for a long time before the women's game started to get a, a little bit more prominence and and uh, and get and exploit some of the, the, the commercial opportunities as well. Hope Powell, excuse me, was manager of the England uh, women's team uh, and had been f and, and did that for about 10 years, but she also managed all the other age groups right. all the way through. So I, here you have this black woman who's a, a head coach, not just of the England first team, but of all the kind of right. age groups as well. Uh, so I suppose... What that did was potentially give some good role models. You know, she acted as a great role model. Mm. If other young women or other women wanted to get into coaching, so they had a good role model in that respect. However, what's, what seems to be a little bit different is, is that now there seems to be an absence of black women in football. I'm kind of surprised as to why that's the case. And my instincts and, and, and the stuff I've read, and it might not be the full picture, but the stuff I've read, is that <clears throat> uh, football's becoming, women's football's becoming pricier, and people, and working class black women are kind of being a little bit priced out of the game. Right. Um, Having to travel so far to get to games, there's, there's not the infrastructure there locally that will enable people to get access to good coaching and all of those kind of things. So I think some of those developments are taking place which, which uh, 
make things between the men's game and the women's game a little bit different. If you look at academies anywhere in the country, they're full of black kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, male, male academies I'm talking about, full of black kids wherever you go, anywhere in the country. Um, full of young black kids, predominantly from inner cities. That's not, the, that's not the case in the women's game, so that's a little bit different. But all of the, all of the, uh, all of the kind of stuff that goes on, the lack of respect for the achievements of black black female footballers or black footballers, the lack of opportunities to coach, um, the lack of opportunities to do to get uh, to be part of the game, other than playing, uh, is still not there, and that mirrors, you know, that mirrors what happens in the men's game. So, a little bit of a mixed bag, but very similar. Thank you. And then we have um, another question um, from Unetta, and uh, the question is: Does all do all these things that you talk about relating to black footballers um, in time gone by? Is it still prevalent in the football fraternity? I think uh, football's definitely changed. Uh, you know that that has to be acknowledged as a result of it. Didn't change just by people assume that. Uh, that things change because you just get an enlightened generation who come along and that's not necessarily the case all of these things happen as a result of action or demonstrations or campaigns or something of that nature and football's no different the changes that occurred in football where you had 40,000 people throwing bananas at black footballers chanting racist abuse where you had a, you know, four sides of a ground doing that. That doesn't happen anymore. You do get isolated incidents. Same doesn't happen in English football to the degree it did. But that only changed because, because of uh, organize, football fans organizing themselves to prevent that happening. And also organizations like uh, Kick It Out and Show Races and the Red Card also had a massive influence on that and gave football fans a kind of education, an anti-racist education, which they would never have got anywhere else outside of football. So those things have changed. Uh, you have to read that question out again, I've forgotten it. Yeah, no, no, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah, so it's... There's um, another part of it. Yeah, so do, um, does all these things you talk about relating to black football footballers in time gone by it still, I think what they're saying is, okay. um, have all of these things that you've spoken about, is it still prevalent within the football fraternity? I think, I think the, because uh, we do focus on crowds quite a lot, actually. So while crowds have changed, football, its infrastructure has changed a bit, but it's still got a long, long way to go. So, you know, when it, the, 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 the era in which the book is set, or the start of the book is set, is kind of the early 70s. And at the time, there were no, there were no uh, black people in the dugout. There were very few black people in the crowd. Uh, there were no managers. There were no journalists. Uh, really, any TV presenters. None of, that mo none of that's really changed much. Um, the TV presenting is beginning to change, mm. but Managers, journalists, uh, hasn't really hasn't really changed. So, look, so in terms of the football fraternity, um, uh, not a lot changed from the authorities' point of view. I think footballers themselves have changed. I think the, the footballers have changed, and I think the fact that England footballers were prepared to take the knee and support the, and you know, act like teammates mm. and, and, uh, and show solidarity with their black teammates. That's something that certainly didn't, wouldn't have happened in John Barnes's time. Uh, he would have been asked to kind of get on with it and deal with it himself. Uh, it wouldn't have been, and you know, and obviously we've got, you know, an England manager who's, who's, who's far more astute and conscious of his responsibilities 
as a kind of custodian or a leader of the national game and, uh, and has been good at setting the tone for the rest of the team to follow. So I think as well, particularly, you know, if you think of most white footballers as they come through academies and into the professional game, grow up, literally grow up with black kids alongside them. Yeah. And, and so for them, I'm sure it's not really much of an issue um, as far as they're concerned. But there are still, but from, an admi but from the football's leadership, and I'm talking about the clubs, I'm talking about the owners, I'm talking about the football organisations like the FA, the Premier League, the Football League as well. Uh, you still have uh, a lot of white middle-aged men, middle-class middle-aged men, recruiting in their own image and not wanting thing and wanting things to be the same as they are now and they've always been. And until something radical happens, until they they removed, until those people are removed yeah. from positions of power. Nothing's going to change. And I wanted to, because um, I was just thinking about, because obviously you were speaking about Black British football, and I came to, um, I came into like, like enjoying football and watching it regularly, probably in like late nineties. I always say that um, France '98 was like that was the starting point for me, and it became like a catalyst for my interest in football. Um, I didn't really pay as much attention to um, English football, like the English Premier League or anything, just casually. Um, um, but I remember it was during that era, of course, when Arsenal were, you know, you had your Vieira and, your, um, you know, and Henri and all of that. And I remember quite a few of my friends who weren't really into football, they just followed Arsenal because of the black <coughs> presence um, of players. And so it kind of, it just reminded me of what you were speaking about, about how, you know, looking up to people and kind of almost emulating people that look like you. Um, so that was one point. But the other one is that, because I didn't really follow British football that much, but uh -huh. I was more into, I was Serie A okay. person. So, of course, we know that Italian football had a major kind of covert um, racism problem during a time where I think it was a lot more over mm -hmm. in the English Premier League around that time, thinking about the late 90s to maybe the early noughties to of late noughties um, and um, you know things like bananas being thrown on the pitch and and, um, and stuff and you know and just the, the monkey chants and, and that was happening within you know that was happening like you know again early late 90s mm. was a time when I was just thinking you know when time where I thought racism was over because it was so covert here um, in the in the UK and I'm just trying to think during that time, during the like late nineties, early noughties, what was because again, I, because I didn't follow English football, what was it like during that time? Would you say it was a time of slumber in terms of fighting against racism, or do you think it had calmed down a little bit, or just, or were they the, or was there an, um, a better question would be is the, I suppose the resistance of the, <coughs> the you know of the, I think early to kind of mid nineties. Mm. Do you think that had an impact on how? people behave. Um. I think what was happening at the time, by the time the 90s came around, most black plays win were no longer a novelty. So most teams had, you know, at least one black player and, and, and you know, teams like Arsenal had several. Uh, so I think what had changed was, and, and although there are exceptions, once teams got a black player, fans, by and large, stopped racially abusing. It, 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 it's, it's, it's not universally the case, but by and large, once teams got a black player themselves, the contradiction of racially abusing an opposition black mm. footballer while you've got one as well, yeah. just didn't make any sense. Mm. And so that began, so that began to change. That was one of the kind of catalysts for that. And that kind of development emerged throughout the 90s. It's interesting what you say about Arsenal, because I know lots of black people from black communities all over the country are Liverpool fans just because of John Barnes. You know, for for because he was the foremost footballer of that kind of particular era. So I have uh, I've got family who live in London. I know black Londoners who support Liverpool 
just because John Barnes and then later on, you know, other footballers like Michael Thomas, David James, uh, Mark Walters played mm. played for Liverpool, and so they all were kind of so the importance of role models on on black football fandom uh, is 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 really important. And I think something, probably something similar, particularly in London, happened with Arsenal as well. So they got, so they went, so its, it's fan base amongst black supporters probably went beyond its kind of North London kind of hinterland to other places. I mean, Ian Wright talks about how when David Rocastle signed for, he came from the same estate as David Rocastle, when he signed for Arsenal, all of his estate all of a sudden became Arsenal fans because they had a black kid playing for the team. And I think that kind of feature probably had a big impact. But I think, come back to your original question, uh, some of the overt racism, the, the, the things you describe, monkey chants, banana throwing, all of those kind of things, had died down quite significantly in English football. It was still kind of prevalent, and it wasn't really until Eric Cantona uh, jumped into the crowd and attacked, uh, you know, that, you know, because he was a ra- Matthew, I can't remember his last name, mm. uh, the racist at the infamous kind of Man United Crystal Palace game, that all of a sudden people went, you know, black footballers were going, we've had to put up with this for years, mm. you know, we've had to put up with this stuff for years and all of a sudden that was the beginning of the the football authorities beginning to take mm-hmm. some some uh, action the football authorities have always had to come kicking and screaming to do the right thing they never just woke up one day they never just kind of thought uh, you know, well, that's the right. Oh, well, that seems a good idea. That's the right thing to do. Let's do it. They've always wanted to maintain the status quo, things as they always are, and they've always come kicking and screaming to to do the right thing. And uh, even with things like the Rooney Rule, as well, that's something that you know that they've that they've fudged, that they've introduced, half introduced, semi introduced, mm. introduced but not monitored, um, introduced introduced kind of officially, but not really checked to see if it's working. Mm. Um, so it's there on paper, but it's not really, it's not really, uh, nobody's monitoring it, nobody's, you know, there's no sanctions for people not doing, it's almost died a death. Yeah. I don't even know if it's been, if it's still introduced, mm. uh, to be honest. So the football authorities have never, um, have always been, uh, have always had to come kicking and screaming to the table. As far as racism is concerned, they've uh, they've they've never they've never been proactive. They've always been reactive after a lot of persuasion. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. And so we have a question that takes us um, quite nicely into the next part um, of the discussion. Um, and that question is from Micah, uh, which is let's see if I can get it up. Yes, yeah, so it's. Um, been present and is still present today what's your thoughts on why racism is still so abundant considering the changes that have come about in football uh, football is a microcosm i know it's a cliche but football is a microcosm of society we'll never get you know uh, you never get uh, we're, while races, while black people are still viewed as being othered, mm. as, as, as second-class citizens, where their very existence, uh, where their very existence can be shot at, can be tasered, can you know, if you think of things like stop and search, use of force, detention under the Mental Health Act, um, that's just and that's just policing, let alone the rest of the kind of criminal justice system. Uh, if you think about how kids can be um, excluded because they have natural hairstyles, uh, if you think about how even to have 
even to see yourself in the curriculum is a, is a battle. Um, even to learn about your heritage and your mm. history, even though it's part of British history, uh, is a battle. Um, even to have your humanity acknowledged um, is, is just a battle. All of that happens in society and football's just, it's inevitable that football is going to mirror some of that as well. So that's the reason um, football's been, you know, into, uh, I mean, I will say that football's been a source of good in terms of education. Um, for the group of white guys of my generation, Football's been the only anti-racist education mm. they've ever had. They never got it in school, they never got it in the workplace, they never got it anywhere else. But they have had, uh, they have had some anti-racist education because ultimately they're a black footballers who they idolise mm. and therefore have got some empathy with. And, uh, and, uh, and so therefore it's been, it's been good in that respect in terms of educating a generation of people about racism and getting people to think about what it means to be, what it, what you know what about issues of what what it means to be um, uh, to be supportive to be to, to 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 be in solidarity and so on and so forth. But it's still the case that football's used as a plaything by organised far right groups to organise and mobilise. You know all of those booing, taking of the knee stuff. Let's, you know, let's be absolutely clear. Lots of that is EDL stuff. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Lots of that is organised by the EDL, EDL members and so on and so forth. Um, who else would, who else would, you know, know anything e enough about Marxism to ha that they hate it to, to, to use it as an excuse for not, not giving in the, you know, for not giving, not, not, uh, for booing people taking the knee, uh, unless you were, uh, you know, politically opposed to, to, to you know, to, to Marxism, and that's because of the, ED, you know, the EDL and other far right organisations. So these, so you know, let's be under no illusions that lots of this. I'm not saying all the people who boo the, who boo, who've been, you know, uh, booing taking the knee are all members of the EDL, but certainly a significant number of the people who've organised the booing are EDL members and, uh, and or you know come from you know or, or come from other splinter far right groups and as long as it's going to be as long as it exists in the society and as long as it becomes uh, a playing ground for far right organisations to do whatever they feel like they need to do then it will always exist in football and in society in general. Brilliant. Yeah, so I mean, we um, I think that takes us into kind of this next part, which we'd we'd love to hear, you know, James and Amy um, about um, kind of the discussion about you know today and um, you know events in the past few years. I know you've touched on it a bit in terms of how you know Raheem Sterling has been treated um, by the media. Um, you know, you've just you've just spoken about taking the knee as well. Thinking about. Um, that really, um, you know, the events of the past year. I um, mean, I suppose it's kind of like um, continuing the answer from like Micah's um, question about racism still being prevalent mm. in football, well, in sport in general. Um, what are your thoughts on um, the events of the past year and how they've been handled by necessary authorities? And also, it'd be quite interesting to hear about the social media impact as well on that. Um, you know, on, on, on recent events. Yeah, I think I think social media is a kind of good place to start because it's where it's where organised football racism kind of takes place now. Yeah. Less so, less so at grounds. It used to be the case that outside football grounds, I, uh, you know, I remember it. I remember I'm an Everton fan. I remember it at Goodison Park. I remember seeing, uh, you know, openly being so far right literature. And that happened at lots of grounds up and down, up and down the country. And in fact, um, uh, you know, things like Bulldog, which was the youth journal of the National Front, used to have a kind of racist league, and um, and based on 
sales of national front literature outside specific particular football grounds. So, uh, so it was obviously a place where the far right used to kind of organise and use it as a kind of recruiting tool. Now that's moved online to social media, and so that's where the organised kind of racists uh, or the people, yeah, the organised racists as opposed to people who are racist but don't organise and encourage other people to take action and do the same. Um, that's where the organised racists kind of operate. So it's inevitable that social media is going to be a kind of uh, battleground. And obviously, despite what, you know, the authority, if, if I was to put up uh, if I was to if I was to um, uh, get a clip of a Premier of a Premier League goal, put it onto you know a social media platform, mm. it'd be taken down within minutes. Mm. Uh, it'd be taken down really quickly because it violates agreements, commercial agreements that those organisations and those platforms have with with the Premier League and and so on. It takes. You know, he asked them to remove mm. uh, racist abuse from the social media platform, and, that, and, and all of a sudden they can't do it. Mm. Um, so they can when they're being paid. So maybe we should ask them. Maybe we should we should have a collection yeah. and uh, and pay for them to take mm. down racist racist you know uh, writings online. Mm. Um, and maybe you know if it was commercially, commercially opportune for them mm. to do so, then they'd do it. So that's one thing about social media. I think say, the, 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 there's a couple of things about the events of the last year that are mm. that are on one hand heartening and the other hand you know disheartening. Uh, the heartening thing is is definitely seeing, and Raheem Sterling was probably the first to do it. But definitely seen a rise in kind of uh, sporting activism, and it takes kind of many forms. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you know, black power salutes on an Olympic podium, mm. but it does take many forms. And, and you know, and I, I suppose a 21st century version of that is is, is social media. Mm. And so and so, you know, it's heartening to see. Uh, black footballers all of a sudden going, well, I don't have to put up with this, and I don't need to put up with this, and I can go directly to my, I can bypass traditional media. I don't need to um, um, uh, have my messages filtered through, you know, uh, mainstream mainstream media and and, and newspapers and talk sports talk sport and mm. all the other kind of. Uh, platforms. I don't have to have my messages done. That I can go directly to my supporters, followers, etc., and talk to them about my activism. And so that's been heartening. And coupled alongside that, I mentioned it briefly earlier about the uh, the role of um, managers, so not managers, but but teammates in particular. Uh, I mean, what's not particularly well known. Uh, is that at the beginning of last season, during lockdown, all the Premier League captains got together, and uh, of which Tyro Mings, um, Tyro Mings, uh, oh, what's the guy, Troy Deeney, and one or two others, mm. by no means a majority are black, mm. but nonetheless, you know, there's a, there's, there were three or four probably black captains, yeah. but all the captains kind of got together and decided collectively they were going to take a knee. Mm. And I know and I know that Ben May of Burnley mm. was one of the kind of most prominent supporters of that as well. And that was really heartening to see that all the captains kind of took it upon themselves that they were going to take a knee in solidarity with the black teammates. And obviously with what was happening in the States and across the world and so on and so forth. So that was really heartening to see. Obviously, Gareth Southgate has done as much as, en as, much as any sporting leader that can, in his position can ever do um, as far as supporting the agenda. Uh, so that's been good. Um, 
Uh, on the other hand, what's disheartening is that you know the Premier League and the football authorities are making all the right noises. And no, they've got all these new campaigns, no room for racism and everything else. Uh, they've got all of these campaigns going on, new, new um, directives to make things, you know, to, to get involved in more anti-racist campaigns and so on and so forth. They have not introduced the new rule mm. properly. You know what I mean? So really, where it, where it, you know, to diversify the game itself, they're quite happy to do these. Well, let's have a. Let's take an A or let's put some money into, you know, this new campaign about no room for racism and so on and so forth. They've got all of those, but they're not going to... But diversifying the game, getting the leaders changed, sweeping out the old guard and getting, you know, a more diverse, newer, fresher layer of leaders and people into the game who aren't just white and middle class and middle-aged and reflect stakeholders within the game itself, that's still got to change. And there's, a, and there's a wholesale resistance to doing that still within the game. And that's the bit that's kind of a bit disheartening. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got a couple that I could go on. I don't know how we are for time. Yeah, yeah we've still got time. And um, we've got a few more questions come through, actually, if you want me to get through those. But you're welcome to continue yeah. with your questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, do you mind? I'll go for a couple of questions with Emmy, and then we can go back to the... Absolutely. Is yeah, that OK? I mean, just to sort of bookend what you were saying about that big sort of sweep out that we need to do now, uh -huh. I guess, to be honest, that's kind of the next hurdle that we need when it comes to race equality in football, isn't it, to be honest? Yep. I mean, obviously, the, bu the bulk of your book talks about, you know, from the players' perspective, uh -huh. getting black British footballers to in the first team and then more, you know, through the 90s, like you said, that Cantona, mm. that Cantona moment was kind of the breakthrough for black players to mm. voice themselves and, and speak out. And obviously now they're, they're doing that. We uh -huh. talk about Raheem Sterling and... Players like Marcus Rashford, mm -hmm. who were just a brilliant example of like a of young black male in the public sphere. And I guess, to be honest, that's the next hurdle. Can we get black players or, or, or black administrators or black managers and up in the upper echelons of the game, really? I mean, you've spoken about the Rooney rule a little bit there, and something that I was going to ask you a little bit about. You might have, you know, if you don't want to answer, you've no, repeating no, go on. yourself a little bit, but... I just wanted to understand, like, you spoke a lot about that towards the end of the book, actually, that mm -hmm. the Rooney rule and, and how it can be, you know, put in place and the pros and cons of it. In your mind, what more can be done there? Because I can't understand what the FA are doing, because since you published the book, like you mentioned, they've introduced it in, like, piecemeal terms, mm -hmm. but they've... They, they, they've not even really monitored it at all. The, In your mind, what on earth is going on there? No. It's, it's, it's just, it, it's... What happens is, in an organisation, yeah. in any organisation where, uh, where, which is dominated, mm. and I, I only speak, not particularly having to go white, mm. middle-aged, middle-class men, but they dominate many of our kind of big institutions yeah. and, f and, and football's no different. They dominate that institution. What happens is if you bring in a whole load of people with different ideas, it exposes your mediocrity mm. uh, on one hand. That's one reason why there's such a... I mean, we have to ask ourselves why there's such resistance to all of these changes taking place. And one of the reasons is is because... Obviously, it exposes people's mediocrity. Mm. And it also, it allows people to, I mean, people have got kind of, people think of it as well as a kind of, you know, it stops. Football's very, there's a load of nepotism in football. Yeah. Lots yeah. of it. Mm. You see these kind of dynasties all the time. Mm. Uh, coaches, sons. Mm. Um, we accept it in football, yeah. almost. Uh, coaches, their sons, their uncles, mm. and so on and so forth. Uh, it exists in the game as well. There's a lot of nepotism at the in the you know not just on the playing side, but in the kind of ministership side and the leadership side of things. It, it, you know, so there's kind of vested interests there. They want to maintain things exactly how they are, 
uh, and everything else. People with power don't give it up yeah. easily, and uh, you have to take it off them, essentially. Mm. How do we do that? I don't know, yeah. is, um, is, is, is the short yeah. answer, but, it'd be, it'd be, but I think it's the next question, mm. really, about how, you know, it's, it, it'd be useful to have, a, a, I've drawn the conclusion that waiting for the football authorities to see the light mm. is going to take two or three hundred years, yeah. and uh, if that, Mm. And it'll have to be, uh, and they'll have to be removed from power. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the only way to do it. How we do it, I don't know. Mm. Uh, but I think that's the next conversation mm. to be had, where footballers and other interested parties can get together and say, what do we need to do mm. to bring about the necessary changes within the game? Yeah. And uh, and that's the kind of next step, mm. because the football authorities will point to the fact. I mean, if you look at the Rooney Rule, for example, th that was first, that took about 20 years of campaigning right. to come in. In, in American football? You mean, in oh, English in football? Right, yeah. Uh, in English mm. football, it mm. took 15, 20 years yeah. to, from, from when it was first mooted and from when people campaigned mm. about it to actually get it established. Yeah. Took about 20 years, loads of resistance to mm. it, wholesale resistance. And when it was eventually implemented, it wasn't done with any kind of monitoring. Mm. Uh, we don't know how successful it is or otherwise. There's no sanctions mm. for people who aren't doing it. I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure if pe there was loads of caveats to it as well, so that in the middle of a season you, you can just hire who you want. Mm. Um, I'm, I think I might be wrong, but I think it's kind of the idea that black that you that a black uh, person should be interviewed for the head coach's yeah. job I think that's gone mm. I'm not even sure it's happening anymore mm. um, so so the Rooney rule is essentially you know dead yeah uh, and so they're able the, the, the football authority they're able to say well we've introduced the Rooney mm. rule but it hasn't been monitored it's essentially dead um, these, you know, there's wholesale resistance on the part of the mm. football authorities to, to change things. So even where things change, and, and, and when something takes 15, 20 years to change, that's draining mm. on people's energies yeah. and people's uh, commitment and so on and so forth. It just is draining. And that's the point of dragging things out mm. anyway, that people get fed up and go and do something else. Mm. That's the point. Yeah. Really, uh, of it, and uh, and then when it does eventually get introduced, uh, it get it get it get in, it gets introduced in such in such down. a watered yeah. down <coughs> way to be virtually meaningless. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean, <coughs> I always question, you know, the day that we have a black England manager, you know, it, it begs you to think, will pigs be flying? Because the amount of black footballers that there are and the small amount of them that go on to be managers as well it's just it, it's just you know unimaginable I, I, I feel like i'll ever see the day where england have a black manager the closest yes. we've come though i guess chris powell has been introduced to the the england setup there which is encouraging to see that they're you know they're willing to have some more diversity in amongst mm. the squad you know you know especially obviously i think that came on the back of what happened with George Floyd in the summer that we had during 2020, well, obviously. But what, what England, in the England setup, they introduced some kind of Rooney type rule where they have to have a black coach right. at each of the age levels. Mm. And Chris Powell was the one who was selected mm. for, the, uh, for the first team. Mm. So that's something that's happened at each of the levels. Obviously, it's a great thing because people can get some great experience and everything else. So I'm not knocking it as a as a as a development. But the danger with it is is that that it just becomes as high as black coaches are going to get. Right. It's it, it, that should be a stepping mm. stone, mm. but it might end up being a ceiling. Yeah. And the ceiling will be, you know, 
you've got a, you've got a, a black coach at each of the age groups, and that's as good as it's going to be, yeah. really. I think of people like uh, Rio Ferdinand, yeah. Sol Campbell, particularly Rio Ferdinand. You know, he seems yeah. to he seems to be quite tactically astute. Mm. You know, has played under you know Alex Ferguson. Yeah. Um, Howard Wilkinson, mm. uh, Sven, you know, a succession mm. of high quality managers, yeah. which you would like to think he's picked up a few ideas from. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I can't remember how many caps he won for England, yeah. 60 or 70 odd, maybe. Um, uh, you know, someone like, someone like him, mm. uh, who... It's a shame that someone like him thinks it's not worth yeah. really going into the coaching because I'm not going to get an opportunity. Mm. And that's a real shame that, um, that you know, people, you know, there's, there's no, you know, it's hard enough as it is. There's no guarantees that just because you've been a good player, mm. you're going to be a successful yeah. manager. Um, but, but, so it's hard enough as it is, but, you know, knowing that you're going to go into the game, knowing that you're not really going to get opportunities mm. is is just really difficult. I mean, when you talk about Rio Ferdinand, you look at the other players in and around his generation. Absolutely. Frank Lampard, Stephen Gerrard, yep. Wayne Rooney, all of them straight away have just walked into they've jobs. All walked into, so. They've all walked into... I mean, uh, Stephen Gerrard walked into a title-winning, yeah. a, a title-challenging mm. job in Scotland. Wayne Rooney and Frank Lampard both started. At, did they both start at Derby? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they both started yeah. at Derby. So they started the second tier of the yeah. pyramid. Sol Campbell started, and Paul Lynch started at the bottom rung yeah. of the ladder, who were contemporaries of theirs. Um, where black uh, managers have had to start, even ones who are, you know, won loads of caps for England and have. You know, played alongside all these. These, you know, uh, uh, you know, played alongside all these. You know, I think someone like you know Paul Ince and Roy Keane who played. Mm. Did they play together? I think they played. They certainly overlapped. Possibly, yeah. Possibly overlapped. <clears throat> did Roy Keane start at Sunderland? Can't remember. Can't remember where he started. But he started quite high up. I think it was Sunderland. I know he yeah. was at Ipswich a little for some He was at Ipswich well. for the time. I think it may have been Sunderland, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It took him a long... Uh, it took him quite a few failures mm. before he, he was no yeah. longer on the radar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Brian Robson's another one. He, mm. You know, it took him quite a few failures before he was no longer on, mm. the, on the radar. Mm. Um, these people are... Uh, these people... These, these, you know, prominent ex... You know, internationals who are well, who are well connected. Yeah. Particularly Frank Lampard. You know, it's no secret he's well connected. Mm. His dad is, you know, yeah. his dad's Frank Lampard. His uncle's Harry Redknapp. Yeah. Um, well connected. You know, you know, he, he, this, this, he he was offered the Ipswich job, and he didn't want it because mm. Ipswich didn't have much yeah. money. They weren't going on. Um, he he wanted the Derby job. The chairman of Derby said, I'm not looking for someone like him, I want someone with more experience. Yeah. Harry Redknapp phoned up, mm. put in a good word. The next minute, he gets an interview. Now, obviously, he had to perform at the interview. Yeah. Uh, he had to sell himself. He had to, uh, no doubt he had to work hard. He had to be well prepared. Uh, and, he, and no doubt he was impressive. Yeah. But he got an interview. He got through the door. He got an opportunity to showcase his ideas and his experience, and uh, and and what he what he thought he could bring to the club. Black managers or black coaches just never get mm. an opportunity to do that. They don't have the same networks. They're not plug those networks. Football is full of networks, yeah. um, and dynasties and nepotism. And black coaches just don't don't have access mm. to any of it. By and large, yeah. yeah. We have maybe one more question and some more YouTube questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've got um, got a couple of questions. So I know you would, um, you'd spoken about um, social media um, at the beginning of this section, um, and we have a question from Jenna, 
Um, and I suppose it's quite um, relevant regarding kind of recent events with the Euros as well, actually. So due to the criticism in social media, mental health for sports players have been negatively affected. Are black footballers given enough mental health support? I think it's a, I think it's a uh, no is the short answer, the no. Uh, and there are particular, um, because of the impact of racism um, and the impact that that can have on your mental health, then, you know, black, play, black footballers might be more susceptible to mental health issues because of the added uh, issues of racism that go along with but I think sporting cultures and sporting environments and football in particular aren't particularly good at supporting mental health it's always seen as, as it's it's only just changing now but it's seen as a sign of weakness if you think about how the importance that all sports play on mental resilience mental toughness and so on and so forth Someone with mental health issues is seen as being weak, mentally weak, quite often. Now, in the past, players used to hide it with gambling, alcoholism, uh, domestic violence, uh, a whole range of different things used to mask, you know, some of these mental health issues uh, that people had quite a lot of the time. Um, And so it's better now that... There's, there's increasing awareness of it. I'm not sure that the structures to support good mental health mm. are in place. And of course, one of the problems with, uh, particularly football, if you you know, if you think of a a young kid from an inner city who gets to play for an academy at the age of seven or eight. Uh, whose community is well known in their little community, whose family and close friends are kind of bigging them up and relying on the prospect of that kid, you know, getting fame and fortune. They've got a lot of pressure placed on them. They're taken out of school a lot of the time. Their schooling's interrupted, so they've got few options other than football. They sign a professional contract at the age of 16 or 18, something of that nature. Uh, Interestingly enough, only one or two percent of footballers who sign their first professional contract are still playing football at the age of 24, 25. The attrition rate is massive. Um, These are all people who are talented footballers as well, so it's not always about lack of talent Mm. it's just that the attrition rate is so high um Mm. and then when you come and so you have this massive you know something you've dedicated your life to from a really young age over the next 10 or 15 years and all of a sudden you know footballers are literally dumped they are because they are literally dumped you know that come in uh we're not offering you a professional contract, you're off the academy, um, that's it, get on with it. And it's families and friends and community are left to pick the pieces up. There was something in the region of 300 and odd ex-professional footballers in prison, usually yeah. for things like gambling and, mm. uh, you know, I'm not, you know, some of it masks a whole range of kind of mm. mental health issues that they've had to face because of the dealing with the kind of disappointments and everything else. Sports and football in particular, you know, if you think the money washing around football, mm. how they will, you know, how they will spend a fortune on a 10-year-old's uh, nutrition, um, physiology, getting them to be the be- very best athlete they can possibly be, but their mental health is totally neglected. Mm. It's in the dark, still in the dark yeah. ages in some ways, yeah. So there's a lot more that football should be doing mm. to support mental health. Um, uh, I think there's greater awareness of it. But if you think about, if you display, 
don't forget there's competition within teams. There might be, if you're a right back, like Viv Anderson, for example, there are five or six right backs at your club. And if you say, I'm, you know, I've, I, you know, I'm suffering from anxiety, depression, mental health, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then you can't, you know, the manager might go, well, well, I'll play the other right backs. Mm. I've got four other right backs. I'll play yeah. them instead. So you don't want to. So you know, it's it, it, the culture of the game mm. is such that it's prohibitive to kind of yeah. uh, tell people that you're vulnerable in some mm. way or other. Um, it's prohibitive because of the way in which that might be used yeah. against, against you. you. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and then we have um, one more question um, in the, on the YouTube um, chat, um, and this is from Kyle. Um, with football having such a following across race, age, gender, etc., to what extent can it be used as a catalyst for change and defeat racism off the pitch? Is it, system uh, sorry, is it uh, systemically embedded within the sports? For the reason I said earlier that it, 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 it mirrors society, then yeah, I mean, you know, racism is so deep-rooted in our society, it's just, it, it, it's like, it's like, you know, I think of it like, uh, if you think of something like, um, oh, what's that, Royal Stuart Tartan, which is probably the most famous, popular kind of tartan there is, it's woven into, you know, the reds and the blacks and the w other colours are kind of woven into mm. it's a very fabric. That's what racism's like. It's just part of the normal way in which society operates. Mm. Um, I think, and, 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 and inevitably, you know, the way we think of black footballers is based on notions of how we think of black people mm. uh, the reason part of the reason why there aren't more black head coaches is because people think that black people can't lead mm. uh, part of the reason why for so long black people were played out on the wing and there alone is because of what we think about black athleticism and black physiology um, <coughs> Uh, these things infiltrate into sports as well and so it's kind of woven into the fabric of sports as, as some of these kind of racist ideas but Carl's right that because of its it's the most popular sport in this country it's the most popular sport in the world it is an opportunity for you know for you know, when you see, there's a, you know, my team's Everton and, you know, I think the last game we played, we had, you know, seven black footballers out of the 11 mm. started. And when, you know, just to see, you know, I mean, it's very common now, so it doesn't necessarily, but every so often, I do think about the impact of seeing my team with seven or eight black guys and the white guys you know, in a moment of celebration, mm. all coming together and all, and all celebrating a goal, a victory or something like that. And it does give you a kind of inkling into what the game could be like in other aspects of it, not just what happens on the pitch. Uh, in all aspects of the game, it does give you an inkling of its kind of... And so I do think that it is potentially a force for good. Mm. Um, I said earlier that, you know, for a lot of white guys or white people of a certain generation, their thoughts and their discussion about racism only ever happens in a footballing yeah. context. So their education about racism has only occurred within the context of football. Mm. And that's got to be a good thing, mm. um, wherever it happens. Uh, 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 and, and so, for the best of them, uh, you know, people then begin to think about, you know, things like uh, the criminal justice system. You know, Daly and Atkinson, look at Daly and Atkinson. Mm. Um, <coughs> suffering mental health issues, 
you know, what we said, you know, what was saying before about use of force, detention under the Mental Health Act. There's an ex-professional footballer who suffers, it's another death, another black death in custody. The significance of it is that it's the first police prosecution for the death in custody for 50 years almost. Mm. Um, despite the hundreds of deaths in custody that have got both, you know, both black and white, um, the fact that he's a footballer has got a massive part to play in that yeah. because it was prominent. And, uh, and because it was prominent and because it was in the public eye and because... Football plays a massive part in 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 black communities as well as as well as the way in which the white establishment sees black people. It's you know that I'm I'm, I'm sure that was a massive in, influence on that black police officer. First of all, even coming to trial mm. and then getting the conviction. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that played a massive part in it. Mm. But also, you know. Um, <clears throat> You know, the importance of football in the development of black communities in this country is massive. You know, all the statues, I think there's one of Mary Seacole. Mm. I'm trying to think of statues that commemorate black British people, mm. with the exception of one that aren't footballers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's a Three Degrees one, there's, yeah. one, there's, there's one for Arthur Walton, there's one for Walter Tull. Uh, there's one for David Rowcastle, I think. Um, they're all footballers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, there might be one in Leamington Spa now to one of the Turpins okay. in Leamington Spa who were boxers. Mm. But the achievements of certainly, you know, the achievements of black British communities. Mm. Are over, you know, and, and a statue is is the ultimate mm. in in uh, in in recognition of your achievements. Mm. Uh, nearly all footballers. So I do think I do think football's got a massive role to play in helping to change generations of people to be switched on. And and you know, it's heartening that uh, that you know. People, you know, there's a generation of people who see Raheem Sterling or Marcus Rashford mm. playing for England, and the thought that they're not black and British or black and English mm. just doesn't enter their heads. Yeah. That and you know, and, and it's it's that their ident that you, that their identity is black and British mm. or black and English. It's it's just a given, mm. and that's you know a good thing. Mm. And football has done that, and that you know obviously translates into other black people who they meet in the work in school or, or whatever it is. Yeah. So it is important in that respect. I hope I've given a kind of convoluted... I hope in there I've given an answer to Carl's question. Yeah, and it's quite interesting actually because I remember after the what was for many the disappointment of not winning the Euros, you know, I saw a lot of conversations around how football had really united people for the first time in a long time. And there were, you know, um, on social media, I was seeing people speaking about how, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was in terms of kind of like background, you know, social backgrounds, but also like um, cultural backgrounds. Of course. And, and race, you know, it was diverse. You had, you know, black players and white, and it just united the country in, in a, what, such a way that we've not seen for a while, particularly with everything that's happened the past year, particularly, you know, with COVID and stuff. And so there were a lot of comments about that, um, that I noticed. But there is that thing, isn't there, where, you know, I, even I, I know people who go to football matches on their own, but there's something about, you know, even if you go to a football match, it's also a place for friendship, you know. If, you, yep. if, someone, if your team scores a goal, you know, you're probably more inclined to hug the person next to you. You might not, I mean, obviously, pre-COVID time, don't yeah. know what it's like now, but you would have, you know, just, you know, gravitated towards the other person who supports the team. You may have not known who that person is. That thing of people travelling together and just these conversations... Um, so yeah, there is something about that, and I think, you know, yeah, I mean, agreeing with Carl, I think yeah. yeah, football can become a catalyst. Of course, I mean, I mean, a, a football ground is the only place where they've hugged a complete stranger <laughs> um, and never even asked their name mm. uh, after it. Um, I can't think of any other 
time I might have done that, it's, to be honest. So, because of its tribal nature, you know, because football's tribal, mm. then yeah, it is a us against, yeah. you know, it is a us against them kind of, kind of, uh, or support for football is very tribal. Mm. And that can be a good thing, but it can also have its downside as well. Mm. So much so, yeah, tribal in a way, so much so. I don't know if this is the, has been the case for anyone else, but in old workplaces uh -huh. I used to work at, when it was casual day, you okay. we weren't allowed, people were banned from wearing football shirts. Right, um, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the four, I, I think, you know, I, I think what was different between, say, uh, even, even, even Euro, even Italian 90, mm. where England did quite well. Yeah. And the Euros in 20, well, all right, they were Euros 2020, or even mm. though they were 2021, they occurred technically in 2021. There was a massive difference in, in that, you know, the, in 1990, I do remember, you know, where there was a kind of groundswell of support for the, for the England football team as it progressed through the tournament. Mm. But by and large, black communities kind of felt uncomfortable mm. with it and didn't, you know, the, the, the flag waving, the, 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 the displays of nationalism and everything else was something that sat very uncomfortably with black communities. Um, it probably still does to some degree, but, but, I, but you do notice, but I did notice more black people black communities being prepared to wear an England shirt mm. and have those, you know, more prominent displays of patriotism's not quite the right word, but certainly the allegiance to the England football team was mm. was definitely there. So I think in those in, in that sense it, it it can be you know, it can be you know, I'm not I'm not underestimating and I've always thought excuse me, that it that that it can be a real force for good, and in terms of the wider um, issues around race, race relations, it can be a force for good. It's no accident that even some ordinary workplaces are introducing the Rooney Rule. Um, uh, the beginning to introduce it, they call it the Rooney Rule. You know, that's come that's come from football into mainstream workplaces as well. So. You know, some of these things are translating into kind of mainstream society. So I do think football's got a role to play in that respect, and it can be a force for good, and it can, it can lead, and it does, and it is beginning to, you know, it can lead national conversations about racism in yeah. sport. I mean, if you think about what happened with Raheem Sterling mm. when he, you know, laid bare the kind of racism of the uh, English media. Yeah. Um, we got some, you know, really interesting conversations about the role of the media in football, the role of the media more, more generally in society, the way in which they demonise black males in particular, um, and black communities more generally, Islamophobia, um, all of those things, you know, football's been a, a catalyst for some good national conversations about race and racism. Thank you, thank you very much. So we're almost at the end um, of the event. Um, I mean, James, did you have a final question for Emmy? Or, um I mean, I w uh, if I may, <laughs> got one more that we, you spoke a little bit, you touched on about like, fans, and that's something that, again, you, you spoke about a little bit in the book, that, you know, the terraces, the football terraces are often are traditionally like white spaces. And I just kind of wanted to get an insight into maybe your experiences as a fan, especially, uh, you know, being an Everton fan, you know, uh, for a long time, like we spoke about earlier, it was a, it was a, it was a side, well, the, the fans, some fans of Everton, you know, kind of prided themselves mm. on the team being white. And mm. you did mention earlier that sometimes you'd see like National Front material mm. being handed outside in Definitely, yeah. games and so on. And I mean, I, I'm speaking from my personal experience, sometimes when I, even when I go to see like a Forest game, I do feel like a bit of an outsider. Mm. Me and my brother are often sort of there and sort of constantly, you know, looking around. And whenever we see another black face in the crowd, there's that kind of nod, yeah, that look of yeah, acknowledgement, yeah, yeah, you know. And it's, it's something that I've experienced, um, you know, going to see football games on the continent, um, mm. you know, as well. So I just wondered, like, if there's, what more can be done to still, you know, because 
football crowds, although they're beginning to be more multicultural, obviously, but is there some more that can be done to make them less white? Or if you want to maybe draw on some of your experiences, you know, going to see Everton and so on? I'm really conscious that yeah. I'm, I'm really conscious when I go to Goodison that yeah. I'm moving into a white space, yeah. very conscious. But, you know, I couldn't not be just given the history of my, you know, my dad took me in 1973 or 74 yeah. was the first time I went in there. And in the first time I went in there, there was, you know, we were probably the, me, my two brothers and my dad were probably the only four non-white people in the whole of the ground. Now, there were probably more black people on the pitch mm. than there are in the crowd. <laughs> uh, and because, particularly in the 80s and the 90s and the early part of the noughties, Evan was such a toxic place, mm for black footballers to come and play. Uh, I'm really conscious of the fact that I'm in a very white space when I, when, I, when I go in there. I must say that even though I've been in the ground where there's been racist chants, monkey chants going on all around me and everything else, I can only think of one occasion where something's been directed at me personally. Mm. Uh, but I am really conscious of going, and that thing mm. where you see another black fan, it's kind of quite comforting. Yeah. You know, we're kind of, okay, this, this feels a bit safer mm. Mm. Because, because there's another black guy there who seems, you know, as comfortable as I do with mm. coming to the ground. So I would, I, I, would, it would, I would love to, I would love it to be the case where you know, uh, where there were just more black faces, certainly at my ground, mm. at my with my team, it would just be a sign that we've moved that yeah. we've moved on a long way. Uh, I think part of the, I, I can't see that changing in a hurry, and one of the reasons is is, is the expense. Yeah, yeah. To be perfectly honest, yeah. you know, if you're talking about fifty pound a game mm. or thereabouts. It's a lot of money. Mm. Um, that experience, I mean, when I first, when I, you know, the, when, I, when I went on a regular basis, I used to go with a group of friends and we all had jobs, but we were kind of, there were some, there were chefs, there were carpet fitters, there were van drivers, none of us had great jobs, yeah. but going to the ground, but going to games was still affordable. Yeah. And we used to go home and away, and we used to go all over the place. We were, this is pre, you know, families came along, mm. and, 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 you know, your responsibilities and your, and your priorities have to kind of change yeah. and everything else. But, but the same group with the same kind of jobs, just couldn't afford to go to games on a regular basis in the way that we did. You know, we, all, we were all season ticket holders. We all went away as well. We couldn't do that on the minimum wage jobs, mm. well, slightly above minimum wage jobs that we had at the time. It just wouldn't be possible. Um, and so I think, you know, the price of going to matches is just prohibitive mm. at the moment. Football's a kind of ticking time bomb, actually, because the average age of, you know, a Premier League season ticket holder is something like 55, right. yeah. something like that. What happens when them 55-year-olds mm. retire yeah. and they can no longer afford to go mm. or begin to die off? Yeah. Uh, what are they going to do? Who's going to be there to mm. kind of... Keep the clubs afloat. Keep, so, the, yeah, clubs, yeah. keep, keep the clubs afloat, you know... Uh, I suppose the Real Madrid and the Man United may always may always yeah. be able to mm. uh, have a fan base that will, you know, a kind of relatively wealthy yeah. fan base who can afford to go, who can afford to pay those prices. But what clubs need to start doing, I think, is 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 see, you know, lots of. Lots of clubs are based in areas that are very multiracial. Mm. Uh, you know, think of, you know, you mentioned Aston before. Mm. Um, very multiracial area. 
uh, you know, lots of lots of clubs are still based in very multinational areas, but aren't doing enough to, you know, uh, make their local communities part of the mm. identity of the club. And uh, and I think they can just do more free tickets for kids who are in local schools. Yeah, get them to have a stake in the club. Mm. In some ways, so that when they do get older, they'll that'll be their team. That allegiance will be there. They're more likely to want to go to games, and they're more likely to want to kind of you know you know spend their kind of disposable income mm. going to football matches. Um, I just think there's more that they can can be done. And then obviously there's a there's a whole issue around role models as well mm. that are really important. If they diversify some of their you know, we know as well that aside from it looking nicer, that diversification quite often has kind of lots of economic benefits mm. to it. You know, you make better decisions, you make more, you're more responsive mm. to the needs of emerging, to emerging issues and emerging needs in local communities. There may perhaps be some commercial exploitation where you can draw upon, you know, um, cultures and and heritages of communities to kind of, you know, uh, that has more commercial benefits. There's a whole range of good reasons why diversification is mm. is is important, and I think clubs need to get onto it. Um, uh, you know, it was never the case that football was uh, football's never always exclusively been a white working mm. class game. Mm. Um, uh, working class people are getting slowly priced out of the game, uh, and um, and you know that includes you know black working class people as well, and reconnected with communities is part of what clubs need to be doing. They never used to be commercial entities. They were always. Uh, a community asset, mm. actually, until until commercialism became rampant within the game, football clubs were kind of community assets, actually, more so. And and, and, and the people who used to run them were like local businessmen who saw themselves as kind of custodians mm. of the football club. Uh, it, they were community assets, but you know your local businessmen. Was the was it now they're owned by kind of hedge fund companies yeah. and and uh, you know in cases you know places like Manchester City and PSG you know oil oil states <laughs> as well so the commercialism has kind of changed the dynamics of the game in in not always for the good mm. but you know in in very kind of profound ways and uh, particularly for clubs who who see themselves as being rooted in their local communities, let's do some community engagement mm. and everything else. It seems like, I don't want to, should I go there? Yeah, it <laughs> seems like, it seems like, uh, the other thing that they can do is teams like Millwall should stop hiding behind mm. The fantastic work their community arm does on their anti-racist stuff, mm. as an excuse to allow racists to get to flourish within yeah. their fan base, and never call them out, mm. um, and hiding behind, you know, there's things like that, you know, making a clear stand about where this club is and where they stand. Just have solidarity with your own employees. Yeah. In some cases. You know, in the case of Millwall, just have some solidarity with your own employees, with you know the people who wear the shirt and play for your team and give their all for your mm. team, um, and who are you know fantastic ambassadors for your club. Mm. Just have some solidarity with them and not uh, not abuse them. Mm. And I don't mean abuse as in verbal racist abuse, but just abuse their existence mm. as black as black men and denigrate their whole kind of experience. Mm. Just be supportive of them uh, and, and just say, no, this is, you know, we're a, we're a club which supports our black footballers and, you know, recognises and celebrates their humanity. Mm. 
our fan base, if you want to, if you want to boo taking the knee or you want to chant racist abuse mm. in this ground, this is no place for you. Go and yeah. do that somewhere else. Mm. We know where you sit because we've got your season ticket mm. details. <laughs> we know which part of the ground you're in. Yeah. We've got CCTV camera and we can match mm. your face with where you're sitting and we can ban you for, we can ban you for, you know, anywhere between a game and for life, yeah. if we were so minded mm. to, but they don't. And that's part of the problem with football, the, you know, uh, and, and we have this culture which people are clinging on to where they're trying to pander to racists. Mm. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and you can, you can, instead of, instead of taking a clear stand on what's the most important thing here, somebody's humanity, respecting someone's humanity or pandering to racists, and they've clearly decided that pandering to racists is a priority. Mm. And that's a shame. And, um, like I said, there are people in that club who do brilliant work in their community arm and in their kind of anti-racist work yeah. that they do and are always let down by their leaders. Mm. Their leaders consistently let them down and uh, they deserve better. They deserve better leaders for that club than the ones that they've been left with, unfortunately. Brilliant. Yeah, I did at one point wonder if um, Millwall would come up in this conversation <laughs> mm -hmm. at some point, but I didn't know that about the work that's being done behind the scenes. Um, so thank you um, for sharing that. And it's a really nice end to know um, um, in terms of what more people could do. Um, so thank you so much for the conversation. Um, Emmy's joined us um, all the way from Liverpool today, so thank you for taking the time. When you say all the way, it's only about <laughs> two and a bit hours. <laughs> um, it's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's commuting time if you live in London. Yes, that is true. But yeah, we do really appreciate you coming over here, and thank you so much to James um, okay. for, um, for staring a really insightful mm. conversation. Very powerful, a lot of lessons learned there, so we really do appreciate that. Thank you, Emmy and James. Um, and I just wanted to let you know um, that uh, this discussion, as you know, um, has been based on Emmy's book, um, Pitch Black, um, which you can read um, at um, New Art. Oh, have we gone off? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, yeah, so this, um, this discussion has been based on the book Pitch Black um, by Emmy, um, who you've heard in conversation today. Um, this book is available to um, purchase. Um, at all kind of like major kind of like um, book outlets but you could also um, read the copy here at NAE um, so in our gallery space for our current for you BU project um, this book is available in the um, in our resource area in library for you to have a read of um, you can also collect a copy of chapter three um, and chapter eight um, which we've touched on um, during this conversation you can collect it from our reception if you're based in Nottingham or you can email info at nae.org.uk um, to receive a digital copy of those chapters as well and uh, before we leave we just want to let you know that um, our current season for UBU um, which is a, a kind of, which is a, a comfy safe space um, celebrating the joys in the different um, facets of black life and um, will be running um, until the 9th of October we also have two exhibitions the christening um, by um, Arit Emanuela Etakudo, um, which will be taking place in our mezzanine gallery, and um, Portraits by um, Roger Suckling, which will be taking place outside the building, and that exhibition is accessible um, 24 hours a day, up until the, the 9th of October. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my um, colleague has put in the link uh, for our survey um, in the chat, so do please um, ha take some time out to fill out the survey. It really helps us um, drive the work that we do and make improvements if they're needed, but also gives us an idea of the type of events that we can put on in the future. Um, but we'll let you get on. Uh, thanks again to our speakers, for all of you for watching, um, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.